Welcome to Grace. My name is Jason, and I'm the campus pastor at our UA campus, and I'm glad you're joining us this weekend, whatever campus you're at or if you're online. Uh, Well, right now we are in week two of this series called Letters in Red, where we're looking at the teachings of Jesus, actually what Jesus said, what he communicated to real people. And in fact, what we've said throughout this series is that there's a goal, there's a purpose, and here's what it is. Here's kind of the guiding principle of why we're doing this series uh, and we want to have clarity on what Jesus actually communicated, right? Like we're, if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you literally follow Christ. And we want to know what did Jesus actually have to say? And there's really two reasons why we're in this series. Uh, the first one is that Jesus said a ton about how we should live our life on what we should do with our finances, on what our our purpose should look like and, and how we should think and how we should talk and how we should interact in relationships. And we wanna know what did Jesus actually say? How how did he communicate? And the second thing is, is what Jesus said and just what people say in general, it says it has a ton to do uh, with telling us more about who they are. And so in fact, if you're uh, coming to this series and you're not a follower of Jesus, then this is a great series for you because you actually get to learn right from Jesus's mouth what he said and you get to learn more about who he is. Uh, well, a few years ago, I was having lunch with a friend and, and a couple months before that, uh, this friend had recently gotten married and so we were having tacos and talking about his career and my job and, and just what life looked like and I was asking him how marriage was. And he went on to say a bunch of like really exciting, fun things that they had done that summer and then the conversation, it went kind of downhill and he began to describe just this, this fight that they were in, this divisive issue that they were facing. And it was one of those moments where like, it just felt heavy, you know? And he was really, like it was their first fight, he was stressed about it. And so at one point in the conversation, I said, well, what are you guys fighting about? And he goes, chip clips. <laughs> and I kind of leaned in and I was like, I'm sure I misheard you. Like, I'm sure you said like deep-seated pain from the past. I'm sure you said this this sin issue that you've never talked about together, Um, but it sounded like you said chip clips. And he said, yeah, chip clips. Like we're fighting about chip clips. And what had happened is in her family, like they always use chip clips. You know, Lay's, Doritos, whatever, Cheetos, they always use chip clips. And in his family, uh, apparently he was a barbarian and just everything went stale and they had never used chip clips. And what happened in their really young marriage is that they did what, what so many young marriages do is that they had expectations for what their life was gonna look like based on what their family's life looked like. And so many people do this, and specifically, they kind of put it on the husband or they put it on their new wife, and here's what they do. They say, hey, my dad, he did the dishes. And my dad, he did the laundry, and my dad took out the trash. Therefore, like, that's what dads do. That's what husbands do. In fact, they go as far, and and people do this, where they go as far to say, it's actually intrinsic to manhood that you do that. And in contrast, if your mom, if she paid the bills or if she planned the vacation, then it is intrinsic to womanhood that that is what happens. They put their expectations that they have right on to their spouse. Now, my friend, he he eventually, they move past chip clips and healthy marriages. They move past chip clips and they move past these expectations. But the truth is, is that we do this to other relationships too. In fact, we actually do the exact same thing when it comes to Jesus. And here's how I put it in your notes. We have these expectations for Jesus, and here's what we do. Our expectations of Jesus are actually shaped by our understanding of love. 
And we do the same thing and our expectations of Jesus are shaped by our understanding of love. And here's what I mean. We have this preconceived notion of what love is and then we know, hey, God's love. Jesus is love and if Jesus is love, therefore, uh, Jesus, you look like this. The way that you love people, the way that you care for people, in fact, even the very things that you have said actually are all about this. This is who you are, Jesus. And here's the problem. It is that just like a family individually, we all have our own definition of what love is. In fact, I think there's kind of three big buckets of love that, that you have in your life that I have in my life. And the first one would be like a personal definition of love. In fact, Dr. Gary Chapman, uh, he talks about this and has, in his uh, Five Love Languages book, and uh, it's famous enough, most people have heard of it, but he talks about how uh, some people, the way that they communicate love and the way that they want to be loved is through gifts, right? Like they love giving things, they love receiving things, and, and other people, it's acts of service. And so the best thing you can do to love them would be to, to wash the dishes for them or to serve them in some way. Uh, other people, it's physical touch. And every guy thinks that his is physical touch. That's like a thing that's hardwired in your brain. But, but we have this personal definition of love and we go, hey, this is love and this is how I love other people and this is how I want people to love me. And then we have kind of like a family one or, or a historical definition of love. And this might be where maybe you were bullied as a kid and so you go, hey, uh, the, the opposite of love is saying unkind, is making jokes. And in fact, other families you, or other people might come from a family where the way that they show love is by teasing. And so you're like, man, if they're not messing with me, then they probably don't really love me. And so we have a, a personal definition of love. We have a family, maybe a historical definition of love. And then kind of bigger than all of them or, or separate from all of them is we have a cultural definition of love. The biggest cultural definition of love right now in our culture is acceptance. Where we would say, hey, the, the opposite of love is, is judgment. And we have to accept people. It doesn't matter if we think that, that it's bad for them or it's unhealthy for them. Like the most important thing is that we just love everyone and accept everyone. And here's the problem is that we wrap all these up. We wrap our personal one up. We wrap our, our family or our historical one. And then we wrap all of that in our cultural one. And we look at Jesus and we say, hey, Jesus, this is who you are. Like, this is how you operate. This is how you uh, teach people. This is what you think. This is what you said. And then it actually get, results in us moving towards where we think we know what Jesus said and who he is. And that can be incredibly dangerous. In fact, here's what we move to. We actually think that whenever it came to Jesus and what he said, we think that Jesus only said nice and soft things. That's who Jesus was. He was so kind, he was so nice, he was so gentle. And the truth is, Jesus was a lot of those things and was all those things, but he was so much more. We, we've created this one-dimensional Jesus who's just nice and just soft and gentle. If you don't believe me, um, Google image Jesus this week and look at the pictures. He's adorable. <laughs> He's holding lambs and it's, it's awesome. But if you actually look at the words of Jesus, what he said, and how people responded to what he said, it'll tell you a different picture. In fact, Jesus had many more followers than just the 12. And there's an actual quote in the New Testament where it says, uh, they heard his teachings and then said, this is a hard teaching. And they went away. They literally stopped following Jesus over what he had to say. There's another story where there was this guy who's a rich young ruler is how he's described and uh, he was rich and all those things. So he had money and he had land and he came to Jesus and Jesus essentially said, hey, give it all away and follow me. And the story says that he went away sad and defeated. The religious leaders, they came to Jesus, they heard what he actually had to say and they went away too. And they went away to actually plot and kill Jesus. Hear me. Jesus said hard things. Jesus had really controversial things to say then, and Jesus has really controversial things to say. In fact, if you're going to write something down, just Jesus said hard things. 
We don't have a one-dimensional Jesus. Now, uh, when it comes to hearing and listening to Jesus or, or just hard things in general, we have a few different options, and, and here's what they are. When we hear hard things, we have a few different options. The first is we can reject it. And we go, no, like, that, like that's not really true. And try to move away in our brain from what is reality. The next thing is we can actually ignore it. We can just continue to operate as if it just doesn't exist. Or the last thing is we can deal with it. This uh, goes into so many different areas of our life. If you receive some bad health news, these are your options. You can reject it and go, no, I don't don't believe that doctor. Let's see another doctor. Or you can ignore it. You can go on and just living your life as if you didn't get that diagnosis or you can deal with it. You can take the medication. You can move forward. If there's conflict at work and you hear some, something hard from your boss or whoever, you can reject it and say, no, I'm not like that. I could never be perceived in that way. You can ignore it and, and act like there's no conflict or you can deal with it. Even with your car, if your car starts making a funny or weird noise, you can reject it and say, that's just how, that's just a car noise. That's normal. You know that's not normal. You can ignore it, you can turn up the volume you can't hear it, it's not real, or you can deal with it. You can take it to the mechanic. And and when we face hard things that Jesus had to say, we can reject them and say, no, he he didn't really say that. That's not what he meant. He meant something that's a lot easier to hear. Or we can ignore it and, and just live as if it's not true, or we can deal with it. And ultimately, when it comes to the hard things that Jesus said, dealing with it means that we obey it and we begin to follow him. Uh, And so if you have your Bibles today, go ahead, turn them on or turn to, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 10, and we're gonna be in verses 32 to 39. That's Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. Uh, And here's what it says. Whoever acknowledges me before others, obviously these are the words of Jesus. We're in the letters in red series, so all of this is the words of Jesus. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Uh, So in other words, there is this public proclamation that is expected from Jesus. There is this expectation that you will actually uh, publicly say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Uh, Last week, Pastor Keith, he talked a little bit about people-pleasing, and I would just say this, uh, we're going to talk more about that and our interaction of faith in relation to people kind of throughout this whole message but even this very, this, the start of the verses, it starts out with this expectation that there will be a social pressure between you and following Jesus. It starts with the idea that you can actually expect that there will be social pressure on your relationship with God. And, and also, it's really important, right, um, that you don't disown him. Because then he's going to disown you. We know what that means and obviously separation. But the, the, the idea is that there is no, like, closet Christian You can't be a Christian in private and not one in public. No, to be a follower of Jesus means that you're following him, that you're telling people who he is and open and honest about your faith. Let's continue on in the next verse. And Jesus is gonna do something really interesting in this verse. He says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Um, It's important that we understand this passage Uh, in in that Jesus, what he's doing and what he's gonna do throughout this next verse as well is that he's talking incredibly boldly, loudly. It's like he's trying to shake the reader. He's trying to shake you as the audience to say, hey, I'm being serious about what I'm talking about. Um, Now, I don't think what he's saying is that like he literally came, the the main reason that he came was for violence. Uh, We know that, but he's making this emphatic point to say, hey, listen to what I'm about to say. It is true, he's using bold, he's using loud language to say, do not uh, suppose that I've come to be all about peace, but I came also to bring a sword. And we're gonna find out what that means. It doesn't mean that he came to bring violence, but we're gonna find out in the very next verse, and so let's continue. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so when he says sword here, what he's saying is I came to bring division. And probably even a better way to say that is the results of Jesus coming 
naturally brought division. Uh, Because even this language here, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. It makes it sound as if Jesus came and he said, hey, you know what, uh, that whole saving mankind thing? Yeah, like that wasn't the real reason. Like I really came to destroy or or for violence. And that's not what he's saying. He's really just saying uh, uh, that this is true. Like this is the result of me coming is that you will experience division on earth. And how are you gonna experience division? I think two ways. One is you're gonna experience division because when Jesus came uh, and he's talking about the sword, one way is that he kind of separated the Christians from the non-Christians. Like there is people who believe and follow Jesus and there are people who don't. It's divisive. Right there, you, you have division, you have separation, and that's why you see this. The second way is that literally just the teachings of Jesus themselves are, are, are divisive. They're controversial, as we said earlier. They were hard, and some people don't want to believe them, and some people don't want to hear them. And that causes division. It, uh, let's continue on reading, and I think Jesus takes it up another level Um, even more division-wise and says uh, a big expectation for us. And he says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me, he is not worthy of me. But whoever does not take up their cross and follows me is not worthy of me. Uh, This is where Jesus gets into this incredibly big expectation for you and I that he would be first. That he would be first. That he'd be the the most important thing in your life, that he would be at the top, that he would literally be above every sort of relationship. And I think it's important to say, uh, going back in that context, uh, these family relationships were the most important thing. Like they were the biggest thing socially, they were the biggest thing uh, um, in the Middle East. Like your father or mother was the closest bond that you could possibly have. And Jesus is demanding that that, that he's above them. In fact, I think the only like earthly relationship in America, at least, that we have that is similar to this or that uh, has a similar effect to this is marriage. And in fact, if you've gone to a wedding recently, you've seen people stand in front of a pastor or instead in front of an officiant and what they've, they've taken these vows and literally they're saying, uh, hey, my relationship with my spouse is now above every other relationship. And so my relationship with my spouse, it's above my best friend. And my relationship with my spouse, it's above my mom, it's above my dad, it's above my cousin, it's above my my kids, it's above my coworkers. And Jesus is demanding that exact same level of allegiance. Saying, I'm first. Put, Put me number one in your life. We continue on reading in the text. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake we'll find it. Um, In this verse, really what he's saying is that you can win in every way conceivably possible in life, but at the end of the day, if you don't have Jesus, then you didn't really win at all. Like, then you missed it. My favorite board game as a kid was the game of life. And the way that that board game works is you want to go to a good college and then you wanna get a good career and then you wanna have between one and three or four children and then you wanna buy a house and and the end goal is you wanna end up at millionaire estates. You wanna retire at millionaire estates. What this verse is saying is if you do all of that in the game of life, in the game of real life and you don't have Jesus, you didn't win, you lost. It doesn't matter where you up because in the end you did not win because Jesus is the way that you will find life. In fact, I think if there's a uh, boiling this down to one point, be, uh, down to one idea, it would be this, that Jesus is saying Jesus over everything. Jesus over everything. The reason why he causes division, the reason why he's the sword is because he's demanding that Jesus be over everything. Jesus being over your finances, Jesus being over your future, Jesus being over your family, Jesus being over your friendships, like you name it, Jesus over everything. When it comes to your relationship with God, he is demanding, he is asking, he is expecting that Jesus would be over everything in your life. Now my guess is, is that you would agree with that. If you call yourself a Christian, you'd probably, you'd go, yeah, that's totally true. I I agree with that. Um, 
In fact, you might even tweet that out later or put it on social media and go, hey man, like Jesus, he's my everything. But here's the problem, is that this is actually an intensely personal thing. Like it's, just, it's not just this pie in the sky, like Jesus over everything. They're for each and every one of us, for you, for me. There's a real thing that is the most important thing in our life. And Jesus is saying he wants to be more important than that. And in fact, he demands to be more important than that. And let me just ask you, in all honesty, is Jesus more important to you than your kids? Is he? Can you see it? Can you say that? Is Jesus more important to you than no longer being single and finding that other person that you've been looking for? Is Jesus more important than that? The thing that you have been thinking about late at night and planning for and dreaming of, like is Jesus more important than that? Because this passage is saying Jesus over everything And if you love something more than you love Jesus, then you are not worthy of him. I know that's where we all want to be. We want to be a place that we can say, hey, Jesus is over those things. And at the very least, all of us have that aspiration. We have that hope in our life when it it comes to our relationship with God. And so if that was true, if Jesus is over everything in your life, if, ever, if Jesus is over everything in my life, uh, then, then what would be true in that situation? Um, and so here's the first thing. If Jesus is over everything, then what should we expect in our life? And here's the first thing. If Jesus is over everything, then you and I, that we should expect relational friction. If Jesus is over everything in our life, this passage, it talks about how you and I, we should expect relational friction. We see it right there in verse 32. It's almost this expectation that you're going to have a pull and desire to deny Jesus to others. Uh, Moving on to verse 35, it says that Jesus came to to bring the sword, to literally separate uh, mother from mother-in-law and son from father. He came to bring division. And so we should expect that we're going to have relational friction friction. Uh, A few days ago on July 4th, my family was hanging out for the holiday for Independence Day, and we went to a barbecue at a friend's house, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and there was all the things that you would expect from uh, great food and uh, a lot of fun and games and the whole deal, and they also had fireworks. Uh, And so um, they had sparklers for all the kids and they were going around and lighting the sparklers and we took some really adorable pictures of our kids who are are five and three and one and and two of them were holding sparklers in their whole like America, you know, like red, white and blue set up and it was awesome. Um, And we gave our son one and then we gave our daughter two. And we took these pictures and it was great. Uh, Fast forward about two minutes and our daughter, she began to cry. Our daughter's two, almost three. And what had happened is she had burnt her hands on the sparklers. And it's okay. She was, she was okay. It was super minor. um, And she cried for a moment, but she's all good. Uh, But we were like, my guess is millions of people who were Googling, like, what do you do with a burn on 4th of July? Felt like idiots, right? We we are. Um, And I began to talk to my wife and I was like, honestly, how did we not see that coming? Right? Like you see it. Like we handed a two-year-old fireworks. Like we handed her sparklers and she can't do hardly anything in life. And we thought that was going to go well. And, and, And then I even said to my wife, I was like, Natalie, we handed fire sticks to a baby. And... And then we were surprised that that didn't go well. Like, what were we thinking? And in the same way, like Jesus said, he came to bring the sword. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be surprised when we have friction in our lives. Like, don't think for a second that you can be a follower of Jesus and be obeying what he says and put him first, and that won't cause friction in your relationship with that guy or girl who's not a follower of Jesus. There's gonna be friction. 
There's gonna be pain. There's gonna be some challenges there. Don't for a second think that you can begin to follow Jesus and there's not gonna be any friction with your sorority sisters or fraternity brothers. There's gonna be friction. Like, don't think that you can follow Jesus and still hang out with those same gals who drink wine on the after, in the afternoon and you know that they're drinking too much and you're drinking too much. Like, there's gonna be friction if you give that up to follow Jesus. There's going to be friction with you and your buddies when, when, when you get to the locker room talk and you know you shouldn't because you're trying to follow Jesus. There is going to be relational friction. Expect it. Because Jesus says, put me above everything. Jesus over everything. Now, I do want to say, um, this doesn't mean that like Jesus kills relationships or something. You know, it's not like, hey, I can't have friends because I'm a follower of Jesus. And, and in fact, we should still do that. My guess is your relationship with your grandma will change zero, right? Like uh, some relationships will continue, but also there may be some significant sacrifices that you need to make relationally and you will experience friction. Uh, there's one other thing that I wanna say. In fact, um, five chapters earlier, uh, Jesus himself, he talks about peace. And, and so even though in this passage, he's going pretty heavy with hey division and, and hey conflict, and this is going to happen if you follow me, Jesus still said a ton about peace. In fact, in chapter five, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, elsewhere in scripture, in Romans, Paul, he said uh, in Romans 12, chapter eight, uh, 12, eight, he said, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Uh, the fruit of the spirit, which is like, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should begin to exhibit some of these things are love, joy, peace. And here's another way to say that. Uh, we should expect relational friction if we're following Jesus, but we should not create it. You can go back. Um, yeah, all right, that's good. <laughs> but you shouldn't be the creator of it. You should not be the creator of that friction. In fact, just because Jesus said, I came to bring the sword, he didn't say, I'm gonna give Christians the sword. He didn't say, hey, be my sword, be the attacker, be the one that's, that's going out there and fighting for truth. No, like we should be pointing people to Jesus and if people are offended at his words or at his teaching, then let them be offended at that, but not at you. Expect relational friction, but don't be the cause of it. Jesus over everything. Um, if this is true, if Jesus is over everything, then what else can we learn? And, and here's the next thing, is that if Jesus is over everything in your life, then you can't lose. If Jesus is over everything in your life, then you cannot lose. Uh, verse 39 says, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake, they will find it. In other words, if you have Jesus, you've already won. Uh, whenever I was in college, um, I played on a bunch of intramural teams, and one of the intramural teams that I played on was a basketball team. And uh, there was one game in particular where uh, it was the semifinal game, um, and so the game right before the championship game, we were playing another, another team, and in the stands, there was somewhere between 100 and 200 people who were there to watch our game, probably, and as well as the game after us. Uh, and there was about three seconds left in the game and we had the ball and we had to get it uh, all the way from our baseline all the way across the court to the other side in three seconds in an attempt to score. And, and one of my buddies, he passed me the ball and I went around someone uh, and I was a little bit further than half court. So it was more than a half court shot, not quite a full court shot. And I shot it and it's, it's going towards the hoop and it hits the backboard and right as the buzzer goes off, it goes in. And there was a, a big cheer from the audience and it was really exciting, really fun. And then I looked up at the scoreboard and instead of losing by 10, we lost by seven. <laughs> and it was great, I felt awesome. I really, I felt so good. But we still lost. And in the same way, what this passage is teaching is you can accomplish everything in life. You can accomplish whatever your hopes are, whatever your dreams are, whatever you desire in life, you can accomplish it. But if you don't have Jesus, you haven't won. And on the flip side, if you have Jesus and then nothing else, 
then you've already won, then you already have life. You already have life to the full, abundant life. You have purpose on earth and in heaven. If Jesus is over everything, then you can't lose. You've already won. And that doesn't mean that you can't be successful and you can't strive and you can't have good relationships and you can't do anything. It doesn't mean that. But guess what? The prize is Jesus. If Jesus is over everything, then you cannot lose. Well, I want us to put this into practice in our life today. And and so here's kind of our takeaway. And the thing that I want you to think about is I want you to identify what's the first thing in your life and surrender that to God. And I don't want to skip over this. Whatever that thing is for you that you would say, that's, that's my hope. That's my dream. That's what I have all of my eggs in the basket for. It's my security. Like surrender that to God. And the truth is that it's likely that you might not be there yet. And if that's the case, then at least ask God to help you begin to surrender, to begin to let that go. Um, my favorite football team is the Chicago Bears, and they just drafted this player that you might have heard of named Justin Fields. And I'm pretty excited about that because we've been bad for a long time. Um, <laughs> but he's hopefully my new favorite player. And so I want you to imagine with me uh, that I had a Justin Fields rookie card that was signed by Justin Fields and and I had that uh, in my office framed, ready to go. Um, And I was just enjoying that and and it was great and I love it. Um, But imagine with me if I was given the opportunity to give that up. And you might ask, well, like, why would you give that up if you're a Bears fan and a Justin Fields? Like, this is exciting. Like, you should hang on to that and, and you see it every day and you're excited about that. But imagine with me that, that I was given the opportunity to give that up. And someone said, oh, you can take it, but the, the truth is what we're gonna give you in return is you actually get to meet Justin Fields. And you get to go onto Soldier Field, which is the, the Bears stadium, and you get to play catch and run routes and catch the ball from Justin Fields. Do you think I would do that? Of course. Like, come on. Because even though the, the cost is pretty high, the reward is worth it. Like, the reward, like it would be so awesome. And in the same way, you might ask, like, like Jesus is asking for everything from me. He's asking me to give up the most important thing to me. He's asking me to give up relationships and friendships. He's asking to take the most important spot in my life. Like, why would I do that? And it's for the same reason. And here's how we wrote it in your notes. That it's because the reward is worth the cost. Because it's worth it. Because in the end, you receive life. You receive life to the full. Even if you lose it, you still get life. And more than that, you actually get Jesus. And think about this, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're not a Christ follower. You get the God of the universe, the guy who created heaven and earth. He knows you intimately. He knows all your flaws. He knows all your failures. He still loves you. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Even if you give everything up, you still get Jesus. My hope for us, my hope for all of us, is that we'd be able to say, Jesus is over everything in my life. And whatever that thing is in your life that that you need to surrender, whatever that thing is, whether it's your kids or or your career or your future or your finances, that you do that. You'd say, God, Jesus, like take that number one spot. Help me to believe, help me to live as if you are over everything. Help me to sacrifice my life and my plans and my future for you because you're worth it. God, help me to believe and to live as if Jesus is truly over everything. Would you pray with me? Dearly Father, God, God, you're good. 
And I pray even right now as we're, we're thinking about our thing and we're thinking about what is important to us and what our hopes are and what our dreams are and, and what we care about, God, and what we care deeply about. I pray that we would surrender those things to you. And we would say, God, I wanna follow you. I wanna obey you. I wanna, as the passage said, I want to love you more than those things so that I am worthy of you. God, help us to sacrifice them and to live as if you are over everything in our life. We pray all these things in your son's name, amen.